So good evening, everyone joining for our, um, our uh, monthly meeting of the BIPSA Boston chapter. Uh, we're gonna have a lively session here about the new BU Center for Computing and Data Sciences, which is just being completed, in fact, having its grand opening this week. And uh, the, the team here will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce the speakers and then hand it off to them. Uh, first on our list is Eric Olson, who's the managing partner or a managing partner with Transolar Klima Engineering in New York. Uh, and he's also a lecturer and guest critic at <coughs> places like Harvard and MIT and UPenn and Columbia. Uh, and he's worked as a consulting mechanical engineer on a variety of building types and also directed the city of Chicago's green permit program. Uh, he's a, a MIT and Purdue University graduate and uh, their firm did a lot of the early analysis on this project and he'll tell us a little bit about that. Uh, next on the list is John Castrinos, who's a lead hydrologist and professional geologist uh, at Haley and Aldrich. And he's the leader of their ground source heat pump, sorry, ground source heat exchange practice. A uh, lot of experience in fractured rock hydrogeology, planning, implementation and permitting of drilling, testing programs, thermal modeling, and bore field design. And so we've done a lot of different geothermal projects, including uh, the Trinity Church in Boston, which everybody knows about. And of course, his firm uh, was the designers of the geothermal for this particular project, which enables them to be all electric and zero carbon. And then finally, my colleague, Anthony Hardman, uh, he's with the Green Engineers. The Green Green Engineers senior building performance analyst. And um, if everybody who's not talking could go on mute, that would be terrific. And uh, so Anthony uh, and the team that he leads did the uh, uh, traditional energy modeling on this project using uh, tools like uh, uh, Energy Plus to analyze the building for, um, uh, for code compliance and for lead. Uh, Anthony has worked on over 100 building projects. He's got a Bachelor of Science from the U.S. Air Force and is a PE in Colorado. Also served on some ASHRAE technical committees and he's guest lectured at places like uh, Northeastern University. Uh, so without further ado, I think if Eric, you wanna uh, take over the screen and share your slides, we'll hand off to you. Uh, yes, you have to stop sharing. Okay, I will do that. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And I, I wish we were in a, I'm a, I wanna be in a lecture hall and like wait for everybody to respond. Like, <laughs> good evening, good evening. Yeah. I think the, the goal is to keep it pretty casual here as we uh, hold together uh, fairly quickly with this, this group. Um, and I'm gonna set things up talking about just the high level story of the project overall, and then talk about some of the early modeling efforts that we did before handing on to John to talk about the, the geothermal design, and Anthony to talk about the some of the compliance and other whole building energy modeling. The, the first thing that I wanna point out is we may not, in your questions, we're gonna do our best to answer questions and share the story of the project, this is a difficult project to talk about because it's so long. It's uh, many great projects have very long stories. And I was just checking the design of this project and some of the work I'm gonna show started in 2013. So it's now nine years ago. And if you think about what were you doing nine years ago, it's not so easy to, to, to remember. Uh, um, so it was uh, maybe a little bit of advice there, make sure you, uh, really keep your files really, really good. If you want to go back and reconstructing the design stories of early of projects uh, is always really challenging. But So here's the rendering. I've seen lots of great photos, but I don't have access to the professional photos yet myself of, uh, of the project. We're not going to focus too much on the overall aspects, but uh, basically it's an academic tower uh, and the lower portions of the project uh, includes some more communal and a handful of classroom functions. And then the upper portion is really a lot of various types of offices for faculty and for graduate students doing uh, different types of, but all very uh, computer-based, not lab type uh, 
uh, work, maybe some with more intense uh, plug loads and so on than others. Uh, the, the architect for this is KPMB, um, and we all work very closely with them on, on that. Um, and I wanted to, I'm going to start by just sharing kind of an overview of the sustainability story and then talk about just a few aspects of the modeling process. Uh, and in the way I have chosen to basically make my standard way of describing like what's the sustainable story of this, we actually borrowed from Dennis Carlberg, who's the VP for sustainability at BU, because he has done such a great job of summarizing it. And so these are Dennis's five reasons that the building will be BU's most sustainable yet as told through my transsolar lens. Um, and so the first is simply that, that the first floor is set uh, a foot and a quarter above the BU re resilient elevation. So it's really ready for uh, climate change and the potential of flooding in Back Bay and so on. Of course, we don't know where we are. We're on Commonwealth Avenue at a kind of prominent site on the BU campus right there. Um, uh, but th this uh, kind of flooding resilience is not so much the story for the building simulation topic tonight. It's more about energy efficiency and some other topics. And there's a few key aspects that uh, they speak <laughs> to in the key of the energy efficiency. And the first is the you know, the, the design for those that have seen it, I was just there in Boston uh, Thursday and Friday and clearly already has a very iconic presence on the skyline uh, with the two very different facades, uh, which kind of rotate their way up and around the building, the, the external shading through diagonal louvers. Which are, we'll talk about the tuning and tuning of that in a moment, but that has 60% vision glazing with the diagonal louvers and is intended tend to be used a little bit more in areas where it's deeper daylight. There's 40% vision glazing on the areas with the sawtooth, uh, where the idea is it's almost always only private offices along there. And so you don't need quite as uh, deep daylight penetration. You can have a little less uh, uh, glazing in response to that. So you have these two different facade designs, but both are working in response to daylight and into uh, providing a certain amount of solar heat gain control the diagonal louver required a certain amount of tuning, tuning the sawtooth the idea is that it's always facing away from the direct east or west in particular. Uh, and then in addition to that, all of the glazing is triple glazing with an overall U value around 0.21 BTUs per hour per square foot. Um, and we'll look at the details of that just a little bit. And that's what results in this kind of rotating pattern of that always sawtooth on one facade with a diagonal adjacent to it, but which one is it which rotates and spirals as you go up the building. The other kind of key energy efficiency aspect is the system choice, uh, which is a dedicated outside air system with chilled beams. Uh, so we have the, the exterior shading always enabling by reducing the loads so that the chilled beams can meet the loads. Um, and then I would also point out that triple glazing has two low E coatings. Sometimes we'll see projects doing triple glazing with one low E coating, which really misses a lot of opportunity for improving the U value. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting that BR plus A introduced in the topic into the project is in order to get enough BR plus A as a mechanical engineer, uh, in order to get enough capacity out of the chill beams, rather than relying on the DOAS units to supply all the air, Sometimes the DOAS air, minimum ventilation air is not enough to get the capacity you need out of the chilled beams. And that was the case here. So there are additional recirculating fan coil units at each floor, fan power boxes that supply some recirculated air very locally to the chilled beams to get a little bit more capacity out of them. And kind of the last point and what uh, John is gonna drill in a lot more, on, I guess pun intended, but <laughs> gonna drill in a lot more on the, uh, uh, the fact that it's an all electric building really enabled by the high performance geo exchange, which uses this unusual Rigan system of closed loop boreholes, but with higher capacity uh, boreholes that with this annular system with supply water flowing down within this encased borehole and then uh, return water coming back up. We'll talk, we'll talk a lot more about the details of that system, um, but uh, that's basically the backbone of providing hot water and chilled water to the building and provide as a heat sink and heat source, 
with cooling towers for peak cooling on the end of some electric boilers for peak heating and backup. That basically leads into Dennis's reason number three. All of that supports the building being fossil fuel free um, because we have, of course, those efficiency steps with the high performance facade, the DOAS system with the chilled beams, uh, but the project could have chosen to rely on gas and instead uh, has the heat pump system so it can be all electric. And then as part of their commitment to purchasing renewables can be a zero carbon building. And, uh, of course, on such a tall building, you could never fit the PV on site to uh, cover the energy use, but the intent is that it's all procured as renewable energy offsite. Last two points we're going to touch on a little bit less, uh, just regarding indoor environmental quality and the, the nature of the interconnected spaces, especially on the lower floors and the feeling of easily moving up through the building and having a lot of indoor outdoor connection on those lower, more public floors which are also designed for natural ventilation only in the lower floors. So you really have that indoor outdoor connection. Uh, and then lastly, all of that comes to what BU is really proud of the climate leadership they're demonstrating with the project, seeking lead platinum. They have this green ribbon commissions really about sharing lessons learned of that. And it uh, was already identified by the planning and there in Boston as an exemplary project. Uh, so for them, it's a very important icon in, in demonstrating the leadership. So I'm gonna talk just a, very briefly now about some of the early simulation work. You see, I have some snapshots from early reports that we were involved in, and that's Transsolar tool in the project to do the kind of early modeling to really help the architect shape the very earliest design. You see, this is from 2013. Uh, we're already looking at the exterior shading on the facade uh, and how that is, uh, influencing the solar heat gain. And this study was an example of what we often are doing those very early studies. I sometimes see these studies showing annual radiation. We almost always look at total daily solar radiation where we establish a recommended budget based on the system type using if it's radiant panel or chilled beams. Here, these budgets were probably for radiant panel at that time. At some point, the project switched to chilled beams and saying, this, we have limited cooling capacity, therefore the total daily radiation should not be over a certain target value. And here we're looking at the east facade, west facade, south facade. This was on March 21st. It was also looked at on June 21st, so at the equinox and the solstice, and saying, does the shading design meet the target value or do we need to make uh, an adjustment? And sometimes it's very simple things, such as pointing out to the architects that initially the uh, uh, east facade, or they were, you know, rotated the wrong way and they need to be simply flipped 180, the kind of intuitive understanding of which way that uh, shading is facing. And then also a recommendation on the south facade that the spacing be reduced by 50% in order to bring it down under this target so that you get the kind of purple values uh, in all cases. The other kind of key thing is really looking at the difference of not only at peak energy, but load. We often find, and that's the case here, again, we're now studying in a different way, what is the annual site energy, is what these upper charts are, for different typical east, west, north, south facing zones versus what is the peak cooling, this should be load or um, peak cooling load in watts per square meter. And what you find is with varying shading, the site energy doesn't change that much because you're kind of balancing between heating and cooling. You add more shading, it increases the heating, but decreases the cooling. Um, but on the cooling side, if you're using rating panel or chill beams or something, you have limited capacity again. And so now it's the next level of detail of studying what is the peak cooling energy and what is the, rec the required louver depth in order to get the cooling energy below the budget that is allowable by our system because we only have so much cooling and peak cooling capacity available because we don't have unlimited cooling capacity. Uh, so it's a similar study of different. Uh, there was also really early studies at the daylighting, which uh, are a little bit less interesting, kind of basically showing that point that uh, the daylight autonomy in the private office uh, is just not going to be so challenging when we're focused on those shallow daylight depths. But it's interesting that some of this work, even in 20. 18, I believe these are later studies from 2018, but this is already using Climate Studio. It's pretty kind of early at that time, but 
those that are using things like Climate Studio. And this as well, the last thing I wanted to point out on the kind of glare side uh, and the daylight analysis, also using Climate Studio in 2018 or 2019. During the design process, there was a challenge that came up to the entire facade proposal saying, and uh, basically an outside voice started saying, oh, maybe you should be considering a different solution. This is gonna have a lot of glare. Um, shades are gonna have to be down all the time to manage glare. Uh, maybe you should think about something else. You can ask me for a coffee or a beer sometime if you wanna hear what that was. Um, and there were some glare analysis putting put forward saying, trying to show that it would need, that these carpet charts showing red all the time, just claiming that they would need uh, shades closed all the time. And so we had to do the glare analysis to show, first of all, even if you are looking toward the corner at the facade, the glare, this, the red is times when you have intolerable glare or orange is disturbing glare in the months of the year and the hours that it's not all the time, it's only in the winter in this example around noontime. But actually what's more appropriate is to not focus on the view toward the facade, but the view for the person sitting perpendicular to the facade, looking at the computer, what is the glare there? And that that really only happens for maybe maximum a two hour period during the winter. So those are the times when shades would, roller shades, additional glare control shades would be closed. It's a much smaller fraction of the year. Um, then next, I want to just touch on the different system options, how we arrived at this uh, decision to be fossil fuel free uh, and have the triple glazing in the DOA ads. So when the project was reactivated in 2018, 2019, one of the first exercises to really study a more traditional option, just the glazing improvements, going to the geothermal system, going to a full geothermal system and really explain those options and doing some very high level cost estimates. Um, and so the whole team did that. The mechanical engineer was also very involved. These are their diagrams to explain the different options to, uh, to BU. Um, this is basically the option that we ended up with. At one time that was proposing the geothermal system similar to what we ended up with, with, with but still with condensing boilers. So just uh, kind of overlook that for a moment. Uh, and then we were looking at the cost premiums. And if you look at just cost construction cost premium, there was a big premium to go to the geothermal option. Um, but when you look at the 40 year net present cost, which is how they really wanted to look at things uh, and uh, the energy savings over the long term, um, that's where compared to in particular the option A where they hadn't improved the facade at all, uh, is really found as cost neutral. And that was part of the argument of why it was accepted to really go for the uh, zero carbon option. And then at some point they became very excited about reaching a zero carbon goal. And that's why the gas boilers were also substitute for electric as the kind of peaking boilers. The very last thing I wanna highlight is the importance of getting the details right and then a kind of more DD level exercise that started to come up. We had made all of these key recommendations with regard to performance of the facade and the triple glazing in particular, not of just center of glazing U value, uh, but overall U value for this uh, curtain wall system as well. Uh, the initial recommendation was, uh, was here as we started to go into more detailed design process for the curtain wall. We were getting some curtain wall designs that even with triple glazing were something more like effective R2, R3. And so this kind of very simple chart and communication was helpful and very important to help the entire design team, both the, uh, the architect uh, and uh, the rest of the team understand we needed to pay attention to more than just the center of glazing U value, but to the overall U value, because that was driving these low performance values, which had a big impact on the overall energy performance of the building. Um, and so that led to this conversation, which is an example of something that's the nitty gritty is always so hard to go and reconstruct, but these are tables from the facade consultant as they were looking at first estimates of what the overall U value of different curtain walls were. And you see, here's the kind of problem children of the first first estimates when first design concepts came for this curtain wall 
it was giving something that we expect should be 0.2 was 0.44 uh, or 0.3. And we felt, oh God, it has to be so much better than that. Uh, and so there were multiple iterations of that. And you can see here where uh, this curtain wall four that was 0.3 went down to 0.25 and then further down to 0.24. Uh, and a lot of that was the result of focusing on how does the framing actually work? How does the spandrel actually work? And there's another iteration where they even change the module dimension uh, because one of the key drivers here actually turned out to be on the sawtooth where you see these narrow modules and the repeating uh, these repeating elements, which are two foot 10 wide and is quite a lot of framing then. And so how do you optimize the framing? The choice of a narrow module is what ends up driving the over facade you value, not the use of triple glazing. And so uh, the performance of the framing, the performance of the insulation and the insulation details for the spandrel uh, all became a big driver. How do we bring those values down so they're reasonably close to the budgets that were established to meet the energy targets for the project? With that, I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it over to John. Thanks, Eric. John, um, yeah, you wanna pull up your slide. Can, can I just ask you, to, uh, Eric, um, so the, the software you used was, was primarily Climate Studio for those images you were showing? It's a variety of things. Like the, uh, um, any of the energy estimates would have been from Transis because we do almost all of our energy estimate work in Transis, but the daylight and glare analysis work would have, uh, later glare analysis, the glare analysis and later daylight work would have been in, uh, in Climate Studio in 2013 okay, is probably the yeah. Probably something and, before Climate Studio in 2013. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, I had one quick question. The the costs you uh, included, those were primarily uh, sort of initial projections for the sake of comparing the different alternatives. Is that right? Exactly. Yep. yep. That was okay. all this just kind of really early kind of high level work uh, in order to help with the decision making. Very good. Can everyone uh, see my screen? Looks good. Okay, very good. Yeah, so uh, now for something completely different perhaps, I'll talk a little bit about the, the bore field installation that ultimately comprised the geothermal system and the modeling we did to support the bore field design. How many, how many bore holes do we need? Their depths, their spacing, et cetera. So, uh, let me see. Okay, so just a quick aside on how a ground source works. It takes advantage of the fact that the subsurface temperatures stay reasonably constant throughout the year. So in the summer, when you're uh, generating uh, cooling for the building, you're doing so by essentially rejecting heat to the, to the subsurface. So uh, the, uh, the, the temperatures leaving the heat pump in the building are, are higher than what's, what, what's, what's coming in. And as the temperatures circulate through the ground, uh, they're lowered and they, and they come and they uh, are reduced to something closer to the ambient ground temperatures that you're starting off with. And then in the winter, the, the opposite takes place. You're extracting usable heat for, from the incoming groundwater. Now, the, the, the groundwater is typically in the range of 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So most of the heavy lifting, so to speak, is done by the heat pump and the refrigeration cycle to convert it to usable heat, shall we say. But <clears throat> having said that, there are limits to what geothermal can do. They're not going to supply uh, steam in an old building, of course. So it's really critical with any new buildings or re rehabs that the, the buildings be prepared for or converted to uh, low temperature applications that are compatible with the heat pumps. So as Eric mentioned, on the BU, the BU project was unique in, in many respects, but with, with respect to geothermal specifically, 
it was unique in that you had a, a, a big building with sizable heating and cooling loads and limited space to work with because this is a, a, an urban campus. So we quickly recognized early in the schematic design process <clears throat> that to make it work, we would probably have to go deeper than <clears throat> usual with the geothermal system. When I say usual at that time in particular, the industry standard was in the range of 500 to 600 feet. And the boreholes at BU are 1500 feet. So the conventional high density polyethylene U-bends are limited <clears throat> to that range of 500 to about 800 feet. If you can, we, we've used one and a half inch diameter pipe and have had them as deep as 800 feet, but getting much deeper than that, you, uh, you risk very high head losses, which translate to, uh, to high pump energy. So the concentric is unique for its diameter being, being four inches for one. Um, it is a different material. It's this composite, essentially a fiberglass uh, in the outer pipe, which is the silver pipe you see in, in, the, in the upper left photo. And that's installed in 20 foot sections with uh, epoxy joined threads. And then it has a, an inner pipe that you see the, the black uh, um, corrugated pipe. And those corrugations are for a purpose. They're on the outside of the pipe, obviously. On the inside, you have a smooth walled rubber compound, but those corrugations provide some turbulence to the water that's returning from the bottom of the borehole up the, the annulus. And that turbulence is beneficial to uh, thermal exchange. So the, what we did initially is we installed three test wells using those, that concentric design for one to see the, uh, how the rock would behave with the depth given that 1500 feet, at least at the time, I think were the deepest closed loops in the country. Um, not a lot of Water well contractors are, are well equipped to reach those depths. So the constructability aspect was uh, particularly interesting to us, but we're also ultimately uh, applying thermal response testing to these three exchangers where we apply a load for a period of time, 48 hours typically, and then measure the response of the circulating water temperatures and from that data, uh, you derive uh, ground thermal properties, specifically thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity, and uh, borehole thermal resistance, as well as ambient ground temperatures. So those data are input into software. We use the ground loop design software. Many uh, designers in the industry use GleePro. So with those thermal properties and hourly heating and cooling loads for, for, for a year, typically, it's a very iterative process. So we worked with BR plus A and Transolar modeling uh, a, a range of different loads to, to look at the, uh, the, the temperature response, keeping the target temperatures within this range that you see in the chart of a lower limit of 45 degrees to provide some buffer against freezing. And then our upper limit is typically 95 degrees, uh, get it, getting much above that and, and you sacrifice the efficiency at the heat pump. So other parameters that go into that modeling are the bore field configuration. So you can run it at, at various depths, uh, various spacing. Uh, in this particular case, the boreholes are spaced about 32 to 50 feet apart. And for this particular uh, uh, project, we looked at the, the effects of uh, varying envelopes in terms of uh, a, a very thermally tight or sound being optimal 
uh, poor being, uh, uh, say, say a, a draft gear envelope. Um, I'm a geologist, bear in mind. Or, and then suboptimal being, being somewhere between those two extremes. And in the chart on the right, the, uh, the, the, the poor insulation is, shows up in the, uh, in, the, in the yellow lines. So with poor insulation, and obviously you've got uh, cold temperatures in Boston, you wind up driving those, those uh, lower temperatures um, down below what, what, a, what a tighter building envelope would provide. So then that's the, the previous chart was just for a single year looking at those heating and cooling lows, but it's also important to project what those temperatures are over long term. So in this particular example, which is not from the project, it's a hypothetical, we've projected uh, circulating water temperatures over a 30 year period. And the reason we do that is while we strive to maintain a balance between heating and cooling loads over the course of a year, um, they're, they're never perfectly balanced. So, and it depends on the thermal properties as well. Um, on some sites, you can tolerate a greater imbalance between heating and cooling. So again, we, we were looking for what are those long-term temperatures and that's what drives the design to try to, to keep those circulating temperatures and a 30 year simulation between this range of a 95 degree max and 45 degree minimum. And this, this is a particular example from one of the iterations we ran for the BU project. And you can see that uh, we've, we've definitely got some, some room over within our target ranges where over uh, a 30 year period, we're looking at temperatures of below uh, 85 degrees and staying above that 45 to, to 50 degree on the, on the minimum temperature during the, uh, during the heating season. So after going, going through these iterations and settling on a, a target, target design, heating and cooling load profiles, we, we laid out the bore field considering uh, utilities, uh, setbacks to the building foundation walls and, and uh, uh, neighboring residences, et cetera. And uh, the, the rings in blue are the, where we ultimately installed the, uh, the 31 boreholes. Here's just uh, an, an aerial shot. Um, the machine in green on the left of the slide is the drill rig. That's a typical water well drilling rig. You have a support truck adjacent to it, which carries the uh, drill steel and casing. There's typically a, a small excavator to uh, dig a pit to handle the groundwater that's, that's liberated from the borehole during drilling. Um, and then you have a series of apparatus uh, to, to settle out the sediments to allow that water to be discharged to, to a catch basin uh, under the auspices of uh, an EPA permit. So again, here's just a close up of the, of the drill rig. This, uh, there's this carousel that, that, that essentially brings casing and drill steel around uh, so that they can, they can thread it into this, the steel that's already in the ground and do it safely and efficiently. Uh, then you have a small pit where the water is first generated. They pump from that pit to a series of tanks to treat the water. Just a, a close up of the, uh, the Rigan product, the concentric product, just the outer pipe. This is going in again in, in, in a 20 foot flight, so 75 per installation. It was uh, Skillings and Son, I should mention, out of uh, New Hampshire that did this work and, and they did a terrific job. Um, the rock in Boston generates a lot of water, so we had uh, multiple tanks. We actually had four in series for the production bore field just to handle the flows coming out of the boreholes were, which were in some cases in excess of 200 gallons a minute. And then here's just uh, uh, another photo of uh, 
of actually a, um, a well-constructed sedimentation pit that was uh, required as part of the water treatment. And uh, that's what I've got. I'll stop sharing at this point. Okay, thank you, John. And uh, so next we'll hear from Anthony Hardman, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the, um, uh, the, the full building modeling process. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, so I, I wanted to say uh, thanks to, to Eric and John for, for joining us in a collaboration setting like this. Um, I, I think it's rare where we get to uh, speak to um, not, not only the analysis side in the setting, but also um, you'll be able to, to see it from, from the designer's perspective as well. Um, we don't always get that, and it's always great to, to hear that perspective. And there's me. I work for the Green Engineer. Um, I'm going to skip past some of this intro stuff, but uh, we do sustainable design consulting, um, covering a, a, a breadth of, of, of expertise. Um, you know, for, for this group, obviously, you care that we, we do energy modeling, LCAs. Um, net zero energy planning uh, for utility incentives and the like, daylight analysis, as, as Erica showed a little bit of. Um, our, our company is a, a certified uh, benefit corporation, which means we, we do a lot of good stuff that just extends beyond the, the bottom line of the profit and loss sheet. Uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit um, um, it, it's just the, the, the flip side of, of the analysis and, and speak to the process because I think it's really unique as, as Eric alluded to, um, just how long this, this project transpired, um, the number of consultants were involved and, and how uh, they all interacted to, to develop this project over, um, over that span of time. So Eric, I think you mentioned you, you got involved in, in 2013. Um, uh, John, I don't know when, when your team got involved, uh, but it was probably, or maybe around the time we did, um, circa 2019 or so. Um, and, and there's some overlap between uh, all, the, all the parties involved. And in addition to us, there, there was uh, the facade consultant that was mentioned, in, and it was it was kind of interesting for me to hear that some of the steps that that were undertaken in those early early conceptual phases were actually repeated later on um, you know as late as the DD or even the progress CD phase so um, just understanding that uh, a lot of the effort that we do is, is cyclical in nature and it, it's not necessarily as linear as as what this process um, outlines here uh, okay so uh, for those who don't know, uh, ASHRAE standard 209 is basically um, an energy modeling standard, and it, it tries to provide a framework uh, that, that standardizes how we should go about uh, assessing buildings. Um, and I don't want to make this a, a deep dive in, in 209 by any means, but again, I, I do think it's interesting to highlight how there's overlap between different consultants uh, in, in this project in particular. So just running through these, um, there's there's 11 of them in the standard, and at, in a nutshell, they start from the earliest kinds of box modeling that you can think of, um, and extend all the way down at the end through post occupancy and performance verification. Uh, early on, uh, Eric talked about um, all the efforts that that his team uh, undertook and. Um, starting with simple box modeling, uh, I, I was going to ask at, at what point on this list uh, do you think that that your involvement stopped? Um, certainly, we saw the, the the daylighting analysis and the glare analysis, and and even the the, the current wall analysis to to inform uh, not just the optics but also uh, thermal loads. So, I, at the very least, that effort. Uh, was encapsulated in those first three steps there, simple box modeling, conceptual design, and, and importantly, load reduction. 
Um, I, I imagine it also incorporated that HVAC system selection. Um, moving on, uh, we get into uh, this conceptual design phases, or sorry, the, the schematic through through uh, construction documentation phases uh, in numbers five, six, and seven there. And I, I believe that's the, essentially where uh, our firm kind of took the baton and, and proceeded to run with some of the more detailed analysis. Uh, the the final step is is basically where our, our our scope is is up to now, and and that's basically the compliance phase of of the energy analysis process. So the drawings are at or beyond ninety percent CDs. Um, there's there's certainly going to be minor changes. Uh, hopefully, no more than minor changes that occur at that point and beyond. And standard two hundred nine. Uh, defines those as as design energy performance change orders and as built. Uh, it typically you those are those are not ever uh, assessed um, uh, as you would see here. It's very rarely that, uh, in my experience at least, that uh, the the team is going to come back to uh, a, a consultant to uh, to assess you know what's the cost benefit of of a decision that's being made at that point. Um, usually at this phase. Um, with their encountering is uh, budget overruns, and so it's it's more just a cost cutting exercise than than a value engineering exercise. Um, which does remind me, I should do go back one. Uh, we, we did, in fact, do some some value engineering engineering in the in the progress CD phase. And if I could, I would pull up uh, Eric's slide about those those curtain wall optimizations that they worked through. So you had, I mean, who knows, dozen or or maybe more different uh, typical curtain wall assembly types, and how those were optimized from you know barely code compliance uh, U values uh, down to something that was more reflective of a true triple glazed assembly. Um, that same exercise occurred again. Uh, I don't know if it was with the same facade consultant, but with another facade consultant. Um, uh, again, at Progress CDs, focusing on, uh, I, I'm guessing what came out to be um, some more problematic uh, independent assemblies out of that out of that whole list, and and the same results uh, transpired as well. So they were able to to reduce those and, and get that overall envelope view value down uh, closer to targets. Um, and of course, just so I'm. I'm not totally missing the boat here, um, but I did in fact do some analysis on there. So there's your spatial daylight autonomy uh, graph to show that uh, we're not just talking words and, and not doing any actual modeling in, in an ABIPSA presentation. Um, the reason why all these charts are sort of uh, titled with with a question mark at the top there is that there there still is this post occupancy uh, comparison phase that exists in ASHRAE 209. And that's really getting to uh, calibrated energy models that I think we're we're all interested in, and um, you know, certainly for a project as high profile as, as high profile as this, um, I, uh, I'd love to pick John's brain to to understand you know how many other projects use those uh, those concentric flow uh, U pipes that that we saw on the geothermal design side. I, I can say that I've not seen those. Um, in in application in Massachusetts, uh, so they they are certainly very unique, and uh, you know we could probably talk at, at length about what uh, what those what those details are and, and what the benefits are of, of that type of application. Um, uh, one of the the unique things about uh, this process, if I can uh, go down on the side for a minute, uh, again was just the the interaction between. Our firm as the as the compliance modeler, so that would be back in this phase, maybe even towards the latter you know, value engineering phase, uh, working with Haley and Aldrich to to ensure that uh, they have the data uh, necessary to to optimize that that ground heat exchanger capacity essentially. And so, as John mentioned, it it is very uh, iterative, and it does require a lot of collaboration. Um, so you, as, as one can imagine, there are uh, some number of uh, design changes that will alter the loads of the building, and those loads have to go somewhere. And so uh, from Haley and Aldrich's perspective, 
uh, they they need that latest information to to help refine the sizing of, of the ground heat exchange as well because that that has a finite capacity. Um, when I first got into this industry, I, I actually worked for a geothermal design firm where we only did geothermal designs uh, and applications. And one of the things that was easy for me in that role was that I got to be both the energy analyst and the designer. So I I didn't necessarily have to rely on another party to to understand or quantify what the annually annual loads are for a project um, that then need to be managed by a ground heat exchanger. It was it was on you know in the other program in the other folder uh, on my PC. Um, so that is certainly a, a unique reality of uh, geothermal projects, at least in this region. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of of many firms, if any, that do uh, both the we'll call it the load side engineering, what what BR Plus A did for this project inside the building, and also the, the what we'll call the source side or the ground heat exchanger design engineering on the outside of the building. Um, so that that requires a lot of collaboration, not just with BR Plus A, who's doing you know the, their peak sizing requirements for design day applications or scenarios. Um, and then uh, someone like TGE doing the, the annual loads that are looking at more typical uh, year weather file loads and, and then incorporating those together in tandem and using those to inform uh, ultimately that those ground heat exchanger details. Um, so that, that again, requires a lot of collaboration and that is unique uh, to geothermal projects. Okay, and then I'll, I'll close briefly with just what I what I think uh, the role of an analyst can be and, and certainly was on this and, and hopefully these can be some takeaways that are applicable to uh, to any analysis uh, project that you might be involved in. Um, my, my number one there is, is understand your audience um, and this is more big picture. This isn't necessarily specific to you know designing the ground heat exchanger or designing the facade or or optimizing HVAC uh, systems, it's it's uh, more about it, your interaction with with the team at large. Um, and and one of the unique uh, things that we can do is really drive collaboration. Um, so my recommendation there would be if if you're not uh, proactively trying to um, have meetings to to communicate your your work with uh, other designers. Um, then I then I think you're you're at risk of missing an opportunity there. It's it's really easy uh, during the pressures of of deadlines to you know sign off in your report and send it off and then move on to the next thing. Um, so uh, understanding that that you might be the only party that's that has an emphasis or or a a key focus on energy performance and, and energy sustainability in a project like this. Um, you know, designers are are largely there to design. Their their paychecks are are, are coming uh, to to deliver a uh, a usable and working building and all the details that that requires, uh, durability and resiliency. Um, as analysts, we might fall in the trap and thinking, well, everybody should care about energy performance, and and oftentimes that's unfortunately not true. And so, use that as an opportunity to uh to be proactive uh, in, in your role as an analyst and and uh, share your knowledge um the, the flip side of that is managing the weeds um one of the consequences of, of not understanding your audience is is presenting uh data that that your audience doesn't understand um you know so this group likes all the all the graphs and the charts and the tables that uh, uh that can be shared um, but just because we have that doesn't mean that uh, whoever our client is understands or, or even wants that. Um, so there was, you know, I'm reminded of a great, of this, uh, it might've been the national chapter presentation uh, almost a year ago to the day uh, that was talking about, or it was titled a, a pictures worth a thousand words um, with of course some, some other subtitle to that, but it was basically fo focused on uh, effective graphical visualizations and and essentially how uh, more isn't necessarily always better. Um, so I'd encourage folks to to go take a look at that um, to to really refine 
and at least understand the differences in, in how you can present data in a way that's meaningful to different on audiences, which which dovetails into that that final bullet there about visual aids. Um, uh, as an example, you you might have uh, audiences like this where again you want to see every chart and and end use data point that exists. Um, and that's one side of the spectrum of audiences. And the other side, you might have a, a local town committee who has, um, you know, maybe a, a an all volunteer uh, committee that is uh, constituted with with people who who don't have a background in, in necessarily even uh, sustainability, or or in some cases maybe even you know building design construction. Um, there, there are certainly towns and cities out there who don't even have that subcommittee, and so you need to be uh, uh, be aware of of when that's the case, and and make sure that you're you're packaging your uh, your data in a way that that tells a story to them. Um, the internal to the team, I would say, challenge the status quo, and, and so that's that's really um, speaking to speaking to other like minded professionals um, uh, and. And trying to get them away from from recycling uh, the the safe thing um, that that might just be based on a rule of thumb recycled from the last project, and the the, the two things that that I would highlight there because we we are running short on time here. Um, uh, one of them you can get from ASHRAE standard two hundred nine, which if, if you're going to follow or espouse that standard, uh, the load reduction analysis, which I believe is step three out of the eleven steps or phases of modeling that are ascribed there, that one is the requirements. Um, uh, many of those other steps are optional, but not that one. And, and the main benefit of there is, is really getting uh, designers to, and, and really MEP designers, to uh, make sure that the, the inputs or the assumptions that they're using to size their peak loads, which are driving equipment capacities and, and construction costs, um, really reflect the the actual design. Um, I, I can uh, give you a plenty of bad examples of where that doesn't encase, and but I won't. I just understand that that doesn't always happen. You you might think or assume that it does, but it doesn't um, as an industry standard. Um, and then the second one there is it's it's along the same lines. It's it's sizing ventilation. So in the same way that um, some companies and and I'm not saying Vera Plus A does this or you know, anyone for that matter. Um, <laughs> but but again, I have seen it happen. And, and ventilation is another one of those variables where, where rules of thumb are are typical. And so it, it is possible and, and, and not very difficult to get an idea on the right sizing of, of ventilation uh, early in the design. It's, if you don't even have to know all the spaces in the building, you can get really close with um, with uh, key high density occup occupancy spaces that'll get you really close to the final answer you need. Um, I will say on this project, uh, once uh, once that exercise was performed, we found out that uh, just to give you a you know idea of scale, I think initially the the uh, the design was conceptually holding about two hundred thousand cfm of ventilation air, and then after going through this process, that that number got cut in half. Which, which is a giant cost and, and load reduction. Um, so, so challenging design teams to, to do a little bit of that math a little sooner than they otherwise would um, is, is highly beneficial. Um, the last thing that uh, you can really espouse for as an analyst are, are just focusing on the key things. Again, this, this kind of goes back to knowing your audiences as well. Um, we, we can, Really get derailed if we if we are are constantly asking the team about uh, details that don't necessarily drive performance in the building, um, and so I'll I'll just I'll I'll end with a with a couple of recommendations that uh, that you can focus on um, in sort of the final phases of a design. So again, these are these are unique to we'll call it to late late DD up through ninety percent CDs. Um, and you understand you're probably not going to have this conversation before that, uh, but you certainly want to have it before it's done. And, and so those two recommendations are, are just about control sequences. Um, you can have a really expensive, really nice uh, mechanical system or lighting system that that simply does not perform as expected. 
if the controls are not written uh, to make it do so, or they're not optimized in some way. And there are, are all manner of sequences that, that you can test uh, as an analyst and, uh, and provide that feedback to the engineers. And oftentimes you might have to do it proactively. Uh, it, it, it should be surprising to, to know that uh, control sequences for efficiency are, are, are even, even today are not a standard part of a lot of design drawing sets. Um, a lot of the sequences that you'll see are, are there basically for operability, like turn this, turn this thing on um, under these conditions and then turn it off. And then when you look for the optimization steps when you're thinking about things like uh, temperature controls or flow flow controls, for example, they're just not there. Um, so look for those and, and uh, challenge design teams to develop those before those things go out to bid. And then the last thing is just performance specifications. Um, there, there are design teams that, that do include those in, in their specs. Uh, one easy example is, is just looking at a, like a window specification, for example, that that is asking for any any windows submittals to have their their thermal performance be spelled out as an assembly rather than just glazing, um, and and then that's a way where you can ensure that uh, not only is the glass really good, but that it's also being uh, designed in tandem with uh, with an optimized framing assembly. Um, you know, which again goes back to the examples we talked about at the beginning of this, where. Um, it, it took you know multiple multiple rounds of, of refinement to get those right. Um, uh, a, a big one here that uh, that happens on on virtually every every project is just fan power creep. Um, and so there there is a there is a way to identify you know, what your fan power is early on and uh, and and help engineers uh, refine that number and have discussions on what that um, what the impact of that is with your analysis. Um, and if, if you can come to a target with that, that is, that is another, uh, specification that, that you could incorporate or, or, or advocate for incorporating into a design spec. Um, and, and I highlight that one just because I've, I've seen, uh, that in turn, and, and by that, I mean, wired air efficiency or essentially how much watt of, of power is required per, you know, per volume of airflow through a particular unit. Um, that wire to air efficiency is something that uh, could be incorporated into into design spec. So we're at time, um, and I half expected to get uh, you know goose ball or something thrown at me back my head here because I don't know that I've left much time for uh, questions, and I will have to run out the door here shortly. So I'm going to yeah, turn I've, my camera. I've, I've been throwing um, things at you for a while now, Anthony. Um, <laughs> So we, we're at the uh, top of the hour here. We've got some questions and Eric, I know has got to run. So are there any specific questions for Trent Solar or for Eric uh, first? And then we've got a few um, questions that have come in already. Um, and I think the one that maybe Eric can jump on is, uh, uh, it was mentioned the lower level uses natural ventilation. Can you speak more to the design of these spaces that are using natural ventilation? What are they like and how was it accomplished? That's something that Eric, you can respond to. Yes, I, I'm gonna be there next week and confirm that as far as I know, it retains a fan assisted natural ventilation. And so it has an exhaust fan in the interconnecting space that uh, connects all those spaces. And that's what's driving the natural ventilation through, through those spaces. It's been too long since we were deeply engaged with the project for me to state with certainty what for us, because we do so much early conceptual exploration, one of the big challenges is often knowing what was implemented versus what wasn't. And since I'm gonna go visit the project next week, I'll know, or, or not, I mean, it's on Thursday this week, <laughs> I'll know a lot more then. Anything else I can help with? I'm sorry, I'm gonna really have to go. Yeah, I, th I think that that's great. Um, Anthony, is that something that was modeled at all in the final models, the natural ventilation scheme? Uh, unfortunately, I, I think that was a victim of value engineering. Okay. Well, it's going to be still promoted even if it's not there. Um, <laughs> that's always, that was good because it gets other people to think about using natural ventilation, I suppose. Um, there were a couple of questions about the, the geothermal uh, that, that we want to um, 
talk about here. I think um, Mariana asked a really interesting question about uh, the future climate when you're projecting the ground temperatures. Does that enter into the discussion at all as you're looking at the, the, the variation in temperature over the number of years? Um, not yet, Chris. There are a couple of, the, the ground provides quite a bit of buffer. So I don't expect groundwater temperatures to change the way ocean temperatures and river temperatures are projected in part because of the ground, but in a part, in a large part because the groundwater just moves so slowly. So okay. uh, I'm sure it's been considered in a couple of PhD theses, but we're not quite there yet for, for including it in the modeling. Okay, and then another question that Arohi uh, asked, uh, wondering the reason for the geothermal loops running deeper than the typical 600 feet. You mentioned they were 1500 feet, but can you talk a little bit more about why they're so deep? Sure. Yeah, I think I mentioned that it's a big building, big load with a, a small, really densely packed um, urban space, right? There's a, there's utilities all over there. And there was just no way we could see getting 75 to 100 shallow, let's call it 500 to 600 boreholes on that site and while resolving conflicts with utilities. So one of the things that I, that I didn't talk about is the depth to rock at this site is over 200 feet. And given that, that most of the thermal exchange takes place in the rock rather than the overlying soils, you're pretty limited with what you get out of a 500 foot borehole. So, so it did make sense to, uh, to take it to those depths for those two reasons. Okay, that's interesting. And then there's a question about the domestic hot water system. And whether that's included in the in the uh, geothermal, or is that got a separate system? Um, yeah, that unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. I know I do know it's uh, a small fraction of the load, you know, compared to the to the heating load. But I don't yeah, know. so I'll actually jump in there because I do know the answer to this oh, one. Okay. And uh, so, you know, because it is an academic building, it it has a very limited hot water. It's primarily people washing their hands, and so that is included in the, the the hot water loop on the geothermal system as well, but it's it's a very small fraction of the, the total. Uh, and I also, I asked a question to Anthony, who's basically running out the door here as well, but because uh, I, I was expecting a nice little chart showing how many lead points we are getting and things like that, since we did that modeling, uh, Anthony didn't didn't uh, grace us with, with that, but he does tell me that the, the building as modeled is a 28% cost savings, which is what LEED uses. And it's important to recognize that that this the actual energy savings is significantly bigger than, than that because of the relative costs of electricity versus gas. And you know, following the, the LEED protocol that we have right now, uh, which uses ASHRAE 2010, uh, we are uh, comparing against a building that would have, um, uh, we would have gas heat in that, so so uh, there's there's a cost penalty just because of that price differential. But it, but it is an all electric building, uh, and, uh, and and Boston University is is funding uh, renewable projects uh, off site in order to supply electricity for their entire campus so they can be uh, carbon neutral. Uh, but for, to my knowledge, this is the biggest all electric building certainly in in Greater Boston, and the, the biggest uh, carbon neutral building that I'm aware of uh, in this area as well. Um, you know, I think um, if there are any other questions, we can we can uh, tackle them. Otherwise, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being part of uh, today. And I did want to highlight uh, ABIPSA Boston does have future events coming. And um, so uh, if you've been here today, you're on our mailing list. Uh, but we're looking to do uh, future case study presentations, among other things, in the new year. So if you have a building that you'd like to present to ABIPSA Boston, send your emails. Uh, or if you'd like to volunteer, we're, we're always looking for more people to help organize these sessions. And uh, it's a small bunch of us who's been doing this for a while. And if you're interested in getting involved, uh, please uh, reach out. And we'd love to, to have you in our planning sessions and, and figure out what, what to be next. Um, so thank you all for, for attending, and uh, I think Shide and I at least will we'll stick around here for as long as people want to answer questions, but I think uh, we're, we're done and we'll stop the recording now. Yes, thank you so much, everyone.
All right, thank you.